welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Welcome to All Things Policy. Today, Pranav and I are joined by a very special guest. Uh, we have the head of Australia Space Agency, Enrico Palermo. And uh, we're really excited about today's conversation because, you know, Australia has such a fascinating relationship with space over a long time. And Australia has like really interesting ambitions for the future. And we'd love to really talk to him about that and uh, what Australia's space sector might look like in the years ahead. So firstly, welcome Enrico to All Things Policy. Thank you. Uh, terrific to be here. Absolutely. Likewise, uh, I want to start with uh, just a little bit of history. Australia, you've had a really interesting relationship uh, with outer space, and you've been part of space activities for decades. In fact, you know, from right from the beginning of the space age. Can you briefly run us through the evolution of Australia's space program and how it's uh, you know different from the typical trajectory that countries take? We are a proud space nation, and and often probably don't signify that enough to to the community and our citizens in the world. But Australia was there at the beginning of the space race. We were one of the first nations to launch a satellite into space from our territory. Uh, We've been a long-term partner of NASA and the European Space Agency in deep space exploration. You know, any deep space exploration mission has been tracked, coordinated uh, from Australia, and that's now extending into the Artemis program. We've been a long-term user of Earth observation data, in particular have developed data cube technologies that really uh, harness that data for our primary sectors, whether it's resources, farming, uh, and other. And we're also uh, key in radio astronomy. You know, so I can't I can't ignore the the contributions uh, our, our research sector and our premier science agency, the CSIRO, have played with, contributed to radio astronomy. And obviously, we have a SKA, the Square Kilometre Array Low Site, uh, out in Western Australia, being developed. But then longer term, something we're proud of, the Australian Space Agency, because our uh, our brand, our logo, is inspired by Indigenous constellations. Australia's First Nations people have used the stars to dictate seasonal activities uh, for tens of thousands of years, demonstrating not just it's not stargazing, this is a scientific connection with space uh, and the stars and ability to read the stars. So that's sort of our heritage as a space nation, and we're very proud of it. But we're beginning of the space age, and somewhere in the 60s and 70s, when, you know, ELDO, which was the European Launcher Development Organization, the precursor to the European Space Agency was in Australia, it stopped. And I always wonder, it's always a thought, thought experiment for me, what would have happened if we kept going? Fast forward, you know, 40, 50 years, there became an increasing recognition in Australia that we rely on space technologies. The modern economy is built on space technologies, whether it's timing for internet or financial transactions, weather forecasting, navigation, we use space technologies. And in Australia, we don't have much sovereign space capability in those areas. We have good depth, as I said, in in Earth observation and and, and areas like that. There was a recognition that we had to do more. We had to build some capability to be a, a good international partner with our partners. But also there was a great economic opportunity. If you look what's happened in the last 10 years, what used to be the preserve of the world's superpowers is is now many, you know, in the hands of commercial entities. So we've seen uh, lower cost to get to orbit, more reliable, safer miniaturization barriers to businesses have grown down. So it was also viewed that uh, not only do we need these capabilities for our citizens to, to look after their prosperity, there's an opportunity we think Australia can punch above its weight and contribute to the global space sector. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, the Australian Space Agency is quite different from other space agencies like ISRO, NASA, or ESA. Your focus is primarily on the private space sector. Can you tell us more about the thinking behind this? So our purpose at the Australian Space Agency is to grow and develop a globally respected, responsible, and thriving space industry in Australia. But it's not just about building industry. We're doing it to lift the economy because of space's impact on the economy. Uh, But most importantly for me is inspire and improve the lives of all Australians. So that's our purpose. And and we're an agency uh, led by government, led led by that purpose. That does set us differently from traditional space agencies, uh, NASA and ESA. So we don't have a big research and development arm to the agency, though we have obviously the CSIRO, Australia's premier science agency, that's a key partner for us. What's been interesting, if you look at the last decade, is the shift you're seeing in even the traditional space agencies 
to realize that growing their space industry, growing that commercial sector is important. You know, NASA, it's obviously been through commercial crew and commercialization of access to LEO. European Space Agency in the last couple of years set up an office of commercialization. India set up in space with a similar mission. So we kind of feel from being a late comer as a space agency, only four years old, we're kind of ahead in the thinking that we're seeing all the agencies pivot towards. Really interesting. I mean, you are actually in that sense ahead of the curve, right? You, you, you sort of anticipated the trend. And that's really at the heart of the commercial space uh, sector. And, you know, we've sort of, we, we looked at the Australian commercial space sector and it seems remarkably diverse. You have all sorts of companies. It, I'm really interested to know how that came to be. You know, what are the key competitive advantages that you think Australian, the, the commercial space sector brings to the table? So when we worked on the, the space strategy, it was in place by the, the team before I joined uh, 18 months ago. But when the team looked at the civil space strategy, there was a recognition we, we shouldn't try to do everything in space, nor, nor are we capable of and nor is that the right use of public funds. And so there was a deep dive into what are the priority areas where Australia has competitive and comparative strengths. And as a result, we have seven priority areas. And these are areas where we feel we have uh, niche capabilities, where we can contribute to the global space economy or where we have something we can spin in. So I'll give one example. So one of our priority areas is robotics and automation in space. Australia leads the world in operating mine sites, oil and gas platforms autonomously, well, not just autonomously, um, operating very complex machinery autonomously and from you know 1,500, 1,600 kilometers away in a harsh environment, interoperability across platforms And you've got operators not just operating one truck or one rover, but a whole mine site of trucks with humans, right? And so we feel that is a a niche thing we can do to look at how you operate on Lunar Gateway, operate on the surface of the moon. So that's an example of where we looked at the the strengths we have as a nation in our primary industries. How do we spin that in? Um, So that's how we went about to identify these priority areas. I think on top of that, our geography adds a lot of benefit to various areas, but it's not just about geography. Like this is not just a play to rent our land right. for ground stations or, or tracking it. It's merging that with our capabilities and, and, you know, we part of trusted alliances so we can protect sensitive technologies, particularly as, um, you know, launch sites get busy around the world. We can offer a, a place for c- countries to, to bring their sensitive technology and then our talent base. You know, I was fortunate to, to work in the United States for, uh, you know, almost a, a decade and a half building spaceships out in the Mojave Desert. And wherever I went in America and Europe, there was Australians innovating in either international space agencies or in your major space corporations, whether they're primes or, or commercial startups or, or commercial large companies. And so we can produce great talent. And uh, I think that's also one of our competitive advantages. Just taking cues from what your, your answer and my colleague's question, the Australian uh, roadmap for 2030 sets to triple the size of Australia's space economy and the space industry. We're quite eager to know how Australia wants to go about taking forward this plan. Yeah, it's it's an ambitious plan. We have a big audacious goal to triple the, the size of a sector and, and we are now executing on the civil space strategy. What I'd look at is the pillars of how we do our work. And, and as I tie up those pillars, they explain how we're looking to develop sector growth to you know, diversify Australia's economy, make it more economically complex, which space will do. Uh, the first is international as a pillar. So we are the front door to the world for Australia as it pertains to civil space activities. And so our job, uh, which is evident in our visit to India this week, and it's terrific, and I'm thrilled to be leading the largest ever space delegation from Australia that's been to India, we're opening doors. We're looking for opportunities uh, to partner uh, just immediately before having the, the privilege to be in this podcast, I helped inaugurate an Australian company's presence, their office here in Bengaluru, Space Machines Company. So here we've got a company that is doing, I, th- I think, access in a very interesting market, innovative market with an office in Australia and Sydney and Adelaide and now an office in Bengaluru. So so we, you know, we are getting the relationships in place. Uh, you know, a couple of announcements recently uh, were our Space Act agreement with NASA to send a rover to the moon. But this is, the agency is not going to build the rover. Australian yeah. industry is. And so we're, we're doing international deals to get manufacturing and, and other things happening in Australia. So that's the international pillar. Uh, the second is national, about building sovereign capability, building um, the ability to do more advanced things in, in space. The way we do that is we drive it through our technical roadmaps. 
So we published three of our our seven roadmaps, and these set 10-year visions and aspirations for that particular priority area, like the robotics one we talked about. Uh, these are well researched. They're not the agency in a bubble. We we consult across industry, across government. Uh, we follow the Cambridge University roadmap process, and and these are great products. And the reason I say that is, you know, we recently celebrated the one year anniversary of our first roadmap communications roadmap that was published, and we saw well over a hundred million dollars of investment in the roadmap, not from us, but from industry, from you know other government sources. And for me, that was a signal. These roadmaps are a guide to where the market opportunities are. They're a signal to investors. There's good market opportunities here and also where government likely will invest. So the roadmap set the vision, set the aspiration. Government has a key role to set that ambition and we do that. Then we have various programs like our National Space Program for Earth Observation that are about uplifting capability but delivering a critical surface back to our purpose of improving the lives of Australians, inspiring Australians. Uh, The third is responsible. So regulation is an enabler of markets. So we are responsible for administering the Space Launches and Return Act 2018 uh, in Australia. So this is if you wanted to develop a spaceport or launch a rocket from Australia, we regulate. And so we really focused on building a responsible regulatory framework that balances public safety with entrepreneurialism. But that also extends into our work with UN Copious and long-term sustainability guidelines, our uh, alignment with the Outer Space Treaties. And Australia is one of the only handful of nations that have uh, signatories to all the outer space treaties, so responsible. And then the fourth one, which is incredibly important, is, is inspire. Yeah. Yeah. You know, space has bark often of curiosity in young people to you know pursue careers, and most probably won't go into space, yes. but they will get on a science, engineering, technical field as a result of that. And so there's a critical role for us to have missions like our mission to the moon and the rover to to drive that belief you can do anything. They're, they're the things that contribute. It's a really holistic strategy to see that job growth. It's a quite a fascinating roadmap and strategy. And, you know, you talked about inspiration. Uh, 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 earlier today, before recording, all of us happened to be at the Space Expo. And I was struck by the number of young people, obviously college kids who were there. And I'm sure it's similar in Australia. But, you know, to to just move on to, you know, the people making decisions right at the top. There's been quite a bit of talk about the Quad and how the Quad uh, as a group of uh, states can encourage space uh, cooperation. What role do you see for the Quad in that and and also for bilateral cooperation between India and Australia? So the Quad, uh, the Australian Space Agency, uh, is, is, is the, it represents the Australian government on the space, the Quad, sorry, the space working group within the Quad. And it's a very important role. Uh, initially, the Quad, I think, has um, identified areas to collaborate on that are very important to the region. And, and so you would have seen the statements that the companies agreed to share satellite data as it pertains to protecting the marine environment, protecting the climate, looking at risk. And I think that's the right thing to start with. It's something you can execute on quickly and really demonstrate the peaceful uses of, of outer space to, to benefit everyone in the region. Importantly, we've also committed to consult on and work on the norms uh, norms and rules of behaviour in outer space. And that's critically important. Space is getting increasingly congested and contested. And how do we as leaders in the region demonstrate the right modes of behaviour? So that's where we started. I certainly have, you know, hope we can be more ambitious over time. I think we've started the right thing. There's a big focus in the Australian government on climate change and, and, and disaster resilience. So how does that translate into maybe cooperative missions into the future is something I'm, I'm interested in and I've heard people talk about. Well, I, there's other ideas. I, don't, I'm not, I can't obviously commit the quad on this, uh, this podcast, but there's ideas to be ambitious. I think we should be ambitious, really leveraging the great strengths the four nations have. I mean, Japan, India, the US, they're all great space nations. And I would argue Australia is too. What do we all bring that can make the collective sum more than we have? As it pertains to bilateral cooperation, you know, that has been signaled by, I said, our presence at the Bengaluru uh, Space Expo. This is the third year we've been country partner. uh, And I'm proud to lead our our delegation here. And we saw six MOUs signed on day one, and which we're about to sign a seventh uh, tomorrow, or we will look at the companies. And so the proof is there that we have space ecosystems at similar phases of development that want to part them together. Space is a global business. If we're not partnering globally, it's going to be really challenging for us to hit our goal of tripling the sector. So our government act- interactions, we really have, uh, you know, uh, 
honoured to have the opportunity to support the Gaganyaan mission, inspirational human spaceflight mission by uh, the Indian Space Research Organisation. And I was very honoured to have a tour of the Human Spaceflight Centre today and, and really understand many aspects of that program. So we're exploring opportunities to support tracking and, and potentially even contribute Australia's depth in space medicine and applied life sciences into the future. So it's not just, again, moving on from a heritage is just a tracking location right. how do we add value and i think we can add we have we hope to have the opportunity to add value to that that inspirational mission uh, and then we have the industry collaboration as i said we just ignored, inaugurated the first australian based company office here in uh, bengaluru for space machines company yeah in one of the previous and for the previous answer you mentioned the rules of responsible behavior and that allows me to transition to a question on space governance there have been a lot of debate about concerns about debris management in space, particularly when it comes to the rise of the commercial space sector. And currently, countries are debating about how best to approach uh, arms control and risk reduction agreements in space. What is Australia's view on how best to handle these issues? It's a serious matter. As I said, we all know space is getting uh, more congested with the proliferation of you know global constellations and more contested. We have to be at the table agreeing and working on things such as the long-term sustainability guidelines. Australia is committed to its adoption and we're close to publishing our roadmap, which will be in the area of space situation awareness and, and debris mitigation. And this is real. I mean, we had a serious space debris event in Australia just two months ago. And we're working, working with our partners to understand that and understand what happened uh, and, and following you know the appropriate uh, procedures with, with the UN. But it's a signal that as a region, we need to understand the space environment well. And so we are focused on how can we best characterize the space environment. And in Australia, we have some incredible startup companies and not just startup, revenue-based companies that can characterize the environment in ways it hasn't been. We have some uh, world-leading uh, passive radar capabilities on orbit, biz optical SSA capabilities. And so how do we sort of bring that together to monitor space, but you know, and do that in a way where we can share the data freely uh, with our partners. So the first step is understanding the environment combined with really bringing together nations to, to pull together consistency and norms and of behavior. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting. And, you know, when you talk about norms of behavior, again, Australia is uh, one of the founding signatories of the Artemis Accords and uh, part of the Artemis program, which is this ambitious project of returning humans to the moon. Where do you think Australia can participate in this or you know what does australia bring to the table so australia was proud to be uh, one of the eight founding signatories of the artists and accords so we were there in, in their crafting and, and in that, that partnership and we re we view the artists accords as something we hope the international community gets behind us in the u.s has been open arms publicly about and increasingly we're seeing more nations sign up what does australia offer we are unique as we are one of the signature one of I don't know if we're the only one anymore, but at, particularly at signing, we were the only country that was both a signatory to the Artemis Accords and the Moon Treaty. And and you know through our analysis, um, you know the Australian government views that you know they're not inconsistent, and, and I think that's really important for the, the future of the Artemis Accords and, and where it goes to next. As it pertains to Artemis, you know clearly we're going to continue our job of being a great partner for deep space communications. And we're, and we're talking with NASA about that and the European Space Agency who's put in a new dish in a, in a new Norcia site in Western Australia. So that will continue. But there's three areas in particular we're looking at Artemis where I think we can contribute. One is what we call foundational services. And so back to the example earlier where I talked about our experience in our resources sector, we think Australia can contribute to the activities to prepare the moon permanent presence in a sustainable way. And, and you know we, we do that uh, in Australia, and we think that's something we can contribute. Whether it's you know think of the site development processes you may need, and we've got universities working on uh, regolith, you know brick manufacture, and, and a whole bunch of things that tie under this sort of broad umbrella of, of foundational services. Um, the second is touched on is communications, and then the third one is and it's probably more, but the third one will be space medicine life sciences, really spinning in our ability to look after our teams in Antarctica our remote communities around Australia, plus some really niche capabilities. So they're the areas we are trying to frame for NASA where we can offer uh, as a way to partner on Artemis uh, into the future. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's all quite fascinating because uh, going back to the moon is exciting. Yeah, humans going back to the moon. And, and that sort of takes me to um, a question that's completely away from all the technicals. Um, so what's your favorite space movie 
Ah, my favorite space media. So growing up, I, I must admit, I was a Star Trek fan. I think it was Star Trek The Next Generation that, you know, sort of got me. So if I, if I think about movies, it was when the, uh, the original series came together with, the, with um, The Next Generation. So sort of your generations when you sort of had uh, Captain Kirk and Captain Picard meeting each other, you know, sort of that, you know, the time travel thing. So that, that you, know, I, you know, unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a Star Trek uh, fan and that, that certainly inspired me. But, you know, it was, it's a great question. It was, it was funny. So I've got young boys and we're, you know, as, as you know, we're watching the Marvel series and, and that. And I think it's the um, either the last Infinity War or, or um, uh, Endgame. 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 And it's when um, Tony Stark is like cast out in the galaxy. Far right far away. And there's a big nebula. And I'm like, wow, as a species, are we ever going to have that window to a nebula? Right. It, and it, it's it's kind of like a deep thought question. I, and I certainly hope we will. I don't know if it'll be in a lifetime because, you know, but like the distances involved. So, it's it, you know, my mind sort of, you know, thinks about that, about, you know, where will humanity go in the centuries ahead of us? What are the technologies we need? Because I hope one day we have a window to a nebula on our spaceships, but that's a long time away. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean... Uh how we'd love to see another nebula. Uh, I mean, you know, just, I suppose this is just a clue into how silly I am. The moment you started talking about space mining, I, I started thinking thinking of the most realistic space movie ever made, which is Michael Bay's 1998 Armageddon. <laughs> uh, yeah, in which a bunch of uh, oil drillers go and save the world. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think movies do play an important part in inspiring us, what you talked about. And uh, we'd love to see more uh, Australian and Indian space movies in the years ahead but uh, thank you so much Enrico for joining us uh, it's been really fascinating to hear about Australia's space program and uh, you're always welcome back on All Things Policy thank you very much and, and it's been a terrific trip to India and, and really appreciate the chat thank you if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network you can tune into them on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.